Can we give a big round of applause for our digital tools instructor, Alan Hasselhoff? Wow.
uh, Christina Strain is there, Mike Choi was there, and she was there, you were there. There were like a couple others. I was, Bosch. Yeah, it was just super, super fun to talk to my friends about the work we do uh, and watch them engage. So, like that was that was the best part. So I did. You were like hosting a party and just yeah, like okay, if you want to show me a Like that was basically it. Yeah, and it was great. It was really cool because you know I did be up there next to you and talking, but also because you were asking questions that nobody really asked me in a public forum, and then you also because you generally wanted to know. And I really appreciate it. Oh, I have to show. You remember when I was talking about cropping, bad cropping? Terrible crop. <laughs> Those fingers? Terrible. That's why you don't do it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You're welcome. So, one of the things that, we, that I kind of learned during that panel was that you were kind of going, you'd been in the industry for a while, but I think you were looking for other creator's perspective about the things uh, about things you've already had opinions about, but you're curious about their their views and like the things that uh, you know their own experiences. And I, I feel like you've kind of been going this is something that it's a kind of a journey you've been on, kind of looking at how other people are viewing themselves in the industry and where they're at. And uh, and I want I'm just curious like because you've been doing this for 25 years. 30 years. Actually, that's no, about 20, 29 years. 29 years. <laughs> 29 years is something like that. <laughs> you know, obviously, there's been a lot of progression. There's a lot of sure. probably a lot of growth. Uh, you've learned a lot about yourself and the industry. And I feel that, that with that, with all that knowledge, you, you probably have some information that, that can help these you know, aspiring comic people. Probably do. Um, uh, that's, there's a lot to unpack in what you're just saying. So, sorry, an hour. Go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, a couple of thoughts. So clearly, I've been in this business longer than many of you have been alive. Um, what I do like to say is that um, these are the stories I typically tell. I got into the business in 1990 um, uh, at a time when. Uh, it was a sort of comics boom. They were giving pencils to anyone that could really hold them, that could sort of draw. I had the good fortune of being hired into the business before I was actually ready, so I got to learn on the job. I think that's much more difficult now, although you wouldn't know by some of the art and mainstream superhero comics. Um, uh, but and that was a total dig. Uh, but uh, it was a really, really lovely experience because DC Comics at the time, uh, which was run by Jeanette Kahn and Paul Levitz, um, it was a hyper inclusive space. It was a really amazing workplace. Um, I'm not sure the comics we put out in the sort of early 90s were particularly good, although we had books like Zero Hour and Death of Superman, which at least put help with the industry on the map. Like that Death of Superman, it's still quite stunning what that did for comics. Um, but it was a really kind of lovely place to grow up. Uh, and the, the ability to learn on the job through a development program was actually really extraordinary. Uh, I sort of bummed to learn that DC Comics' current development program focuses on people who are already in the industry, and they're basically teaching them how to draw like DC Comics people. Um, and that seems really uncool. Um, it's, it's that would not be my approach. The other thing that I, again, sort of, Ron Mars, the writer, what's called, there's a group of us who've been around for a really long time, and, I think it was Ron and Bill Sienkiewicz, and I'm dropping a few names right there that you might know. We we're talking about what it is to survive in an industry like this. Uh, and we're like, and he's like, oh yeah, we're survivors. I was like, oh my god, I'm old enough to be a survivor or something. <laughs> and survivor is such a, it's like, oh, you survived the zombie apocalypse. You survived mainstream superhero comics. Like, right? Like, it's a, it's, there's something sort of heavy about that. Uh, as an industry, it's actually kind of amazing, I think. My experience as an industry, I would say about 80% ridiculously positive, uh, and then 20% not so, but I think that would be true in any industry anywhere. There's I think those are good odds. Yeah, I think those are really, really good odds. I've met really extraordinary people, some amazingly talented people, uh, and I've literally traveled the world, uh, which is a completely unexpected byproduct of what I do. Um, to be able to be on five different continents, you know, drawing comic books for people. That's actually pretty cool. That's amazing. So, when you, you said you, you, you entered the DC development program, were you, were you so you already gone to art school? 
So, um, does anyone here know how I got in the comics? You don't have to. I read the Wikipedia if anybody wants. I can send you the link. I, I will, I, but it's it's worthwhile because I think I'm not sure how if that could be replicated. Um, uh, I was a self-taught artist. I don't know how many of you are self-taught artists, um, and I didn't really take an art class actually until the summer before college. I lived, was raised in Southern California, went to school at the New York City and studied. I was an illustration major, actually, not even a cartoon major. Well, Eisner was one of my instructors. Um, yes, we fought a lot about representation in comics, which I think is amazing considering where we are today. Um, anyway, uh, knowing very clearly who I wanted to draw for and what I wanted to draw, uh, I was obsessed with finding Karen Berger, the then um, editor. Gosh, this was even before the Vertigo the Bridge. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, even before the Vertigo the Bridge started. But she was sort of famous editor. She worked on Swamp Thing and Animal Man, all these sort of adult print books. And she edited Wonder Woman. And I was like, that's what I thought. That's what I have to do. I have to draw Wonder Woman. Um, so when I got to New York City, literally the first day, uh, I found 666 Fifth Avenue, which is where DC Comics was. And I made a phone call when they had paid phones, and I called Karen Berger to ask if I could visit her. And strangely, she said yes. Um, not that day, but uh, over, I forget what it was, over a period of months, she allowed me to come up to her office. If memory serves, I met her once at a convention. I think it might have been the summer before. But this sort of, like, hey, can I come meet you? Sure, was unheard of. And to this day, she still doesn't know why she said yes. What she did, though, was give me comic scripts to work from. So I, I would have actual practice scripts. I would go home with the pages. She'd say, call me in six months. I would go back and write on the calendar. Like, OK, uh, to, to the six-month day call. Um, and she would see me over a period of a couple of years. Ultimately, my pages ended up in the hands of the the head of the new talent development program, I got hired. But I'm not sure that would ever happen again. I don't know. Like, do you think that would happen? Like, could you just call someone and be like, I want a job? And they're like, sure. <laughs> Come on up. I, I think I think that getting into comics is is very different for most people. I, I was a big fan myself, and I of course wanted to work in comics, but I kind of given up on the dream a little bit, so I'm gonna be a graphic designer. That's a table goal. And I happened to live in San Diego and I answered an ad and I ended up at the Wildstorm offices and thinking, where the hell am I? And then I'm like, okay, I'm in comics, and I can just stay in here. So like I just think it's it's about having the willpower and the drive to do it. I mean that's gotta be a huge part, right? Yeah, so a big part of the story I like to tell, I'd be curious what your take on this is. I was driven because I was a closet gay kid, it was a really closeted um, uh, because I desperately wanted to escape where I was, because I came from what I believed was a fairly, I mean, I lived in Orange County in the 80s, which is a hyper-conservative um, county at the time, and uh, my, my feeling was if I went to New York, became a comic book artist, uh, got famous, had my name in lights, etc., it would be okay to come out, because of at least sort of counterbalance Again, right? Like, oh, he's super successful, lives in New York, did his dream, writes across one to one, well, he's gay, we can live with that. That was really the sort of, I was motivated by that. Um, what's been interesting over the years is I've lost that, like, that's no longer a thing. And so finding new reasons to sort of the drive, the drive uh, as I've gotten older, has been an interesting challenge. Well, so, I mean, it's terrible to know that one of your passions is Wonder Woman. Sure. And, you know, uh, I remember you told me a story where uh, you were doing some uh, Deanna Troy uh, uh, piece. She was Wonder Woman, and or I think it was, but basically you designed the part of the costume, and you, given that basically you stopped the book, and another artist picked it up, and another artist was, was doing some things with the costume. Basically, there was a belt. The costume was wrong. Yeah. It was a turtleneck. They weren't driving the turtleneck. It was a low sun belt, not functional. And she was wearing heels. And the other artist was kept trying to like put me that like utility belt. Yes. And, and I remember you told me the story where like, you try to tell the artist like it's it's for fashion. Yes. It's for looks. There's, it doesn't have to do something. It just looks good. And and but that so, was very fun. so I mean there, there's gotta be I mean it seems like you enjoy that aspect too, the you know, creating like infusing fashion and, and design into the characters. 
and you know, in that particular case, and you know, maybe finding like some sort of like, I don't know, like a, a way to incorporate that in your, your want and will to, to work on Wonder Woman and some of those things. No, sure. I mean, uh, I mean, here's the thing. Every assignment I have at some point, I don't know. Again, I don't know for creators in here for like this. Uh, at some point, I get lost in the world building part of it. I mean, that's the fun part, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to do this in ancient Greece. So I'm doing tons of research on ancient Greece and what does this total look like or whatever. I find design, world building, the opportunity to do that, especially with characters like this, is such a rarefied one that I really love it. There are very few people that actually ever get to put their artistic imprint on Wonder Woman or the Titans. I mean, relatively. There are a lot of, it seems like there are a lot of them, it's actually a small number, and let alone to be known for it, like that's even smaller. So it's a real gift, I think, in our business. If you, and again, I say our business, I'm talking about the business of comics. Clearly, I live in this very, I was saying earlier, like a very siloed part. I, I, I do corporate comics, right, which is a totally different world. Um, clearly, I work with Dr. Doom, right? Like, so that's like, that's a different thing than a lot of other people do. Uh, and I like making that distinction clear because I don't ever need to say I'm speaking for everyone or the industry as a whole. I'm talking about a very specific sliver of our business. But I will say the ability to put Angela in angel drag, right, is kind of an amazing thing. Um, that they took her right out of the minute I left this book. Uh, or to be able to draw Captain Marvel, like, it's, you know, it's actually, there is something really, really fun about being able to put your artistic imprint on an icon that currently is known around the world. Like that's, and to be known for it, that's actually pretty great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, my small part, I feel the same way. Yeah. Tell me get to you know, do a Batman page or something. Um, so because of that, you and I do both work in corporate comics, big mainstream comics, and then you come to this program, you, you're talking to the students, you taught the program before, um, and a lot of our, the students are doing memoirs and, or, you know, they're, they're just, maybe they're aspiring to do those things we've, we've been working on, but, um, or maybe not, maybe that's something they never even want to get near. And what would you, it's such a different path than either you or I have done, what, I mean, what can, what can you tell them that, that would, that may help them? I, I don't know, you know, like. Tell people who are not on the corporate comics They just don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. Don't. <laughs> uh, the, the number one thing I would say is the, the reason to do corporate comics and again, by corporate comics, I mean mainstream superhero comics, Marvel, DC, some image books, Star Press, etc. is because you have a longing to put your artistic imprint on Captain America, or the Fantastic Four, or Storm, right? Because that's a dream. It's a pretty fucking amazing thing to have that dream come true. So, like, totally. definitely pursue it. Ha, you're like, oh my god, I'm getting paid to draw the Orphan Black cast. Like, how awesome is that? Um, but I tend to say um, that that's the real reason to pursue that avenue if you're not interested in it. Or, or, or like, excuse me, if that, that's the real reason to pursue that avenue. Otherwise, um, tell the stories you want to tell, work in a way that you want to work in. I find I'm most interested these days in stories that have nothing to do with these characters and everything to do with yours, right? Like, I've been doing this for so long that, like, oh my god, another Wolverine story. Like, do I care? On some level, I do, but I'm much more interested in things I don't know about. I'm much more interested in work that is not like mine. I'm much more interested in young spirits when I'm old. Um, like, and when I, that doesn't necessarily mean age, that also is just sort of freshness, um, a point of view that I don't know about, uh, a place I've never been. Like, that stuff excites me far more, so I would encourage more of that from as as many of you heard yesterday today practically from a business perspective the one thing that corporate comics do is pay well so uh you know because it's warner brothers and disney like they they've got a lot of money so it is another reason to work in those avenues if you can because they the, the pay is very decent but if they're if that's not a motivator i'd say leave it behind and go make the world more interesting Basically. Well said. Thank you. Well said, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you, you, you've been interacting with the students today with the figure on class, and um, I think that you, you know, this the opportunity to come in and, and teach, and I think you've, you've, you've taught several other places. 
you know, it, it, is, is that what I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. This is, I did not design this Don Troy costume. I would not have put her in football shoulder pads. <laughs> okay. You know, we could just critique every other uh, I'm just saying, I, that's not a choice I would have made. <laughs> you know, one of the things I noticed about your, your pages, um, it, they, they have a lot of characters on them. Yes. And, and is that like, is it always called out for that, or do you kind of push that on your own? Because it seems like something you, you just do. Uh, so clearly I like drawing lots of characters. Uh, so, uh, you may or may not know, I come from the George Press School. George Press, uh, incredibly famous um, in, in superhero comics, particularly the 70s and 80s. New Teen Titans, Christ of on Infinite Earths, Wonder Woman Avengers. George was... Um, uh, when I first started reading comics, I was 12, and I picked up New Teen Titans number 12. I was like, oh my god, this is how I want to draw forever. Uh, and I'm sure you all have an influential impact like that, where you saw something like, yes, that's it. That's what I want to do. Um, and so over the years, uh, as I learned to you know, copy George Orly, um, I, I realized that part of that comes from believing in this notion of artistic tradition, right? So that, it was a way to pay homage to someone I cared about, it was also, whose work meant something to me, it was also a way to perpetuate a way of working which I felt was not common, because it's a lot of labor, it's hard. Um, hard is about long, like when you're drawing the accents, it's a really hard kind of, but it can take a long time when there are 37 characters. As a colorist, I can totally, yes. Yes, <laughs> right. Um, so anyway, uh, when, I, I was one of those people that was not necessarily interested in eschewing, eschewing my influence. Like I was embracing it. I was forming it and perpetuating it because I was really into it, right? Like I wanted to be known as like uh, an offspring of George Brett. Like I was not ashamed of it or embarrassed by it. Like because in my head again, it was just, it was a way of working. So it wasn't hard. It wasn't hard on you or yourself to do that. You wanted to do that. Like you enjoyed. You also enjoyed. Yes. And so one of the things that appealed to me about George, particularly, there were two or three things. One, he had these really hyper detailed uh, panel pages. Most common panel pages were like five, six panels. He would do eight, ten, twelve. And from a design standpoint, I really loved it. It was an enormous amount of information in the comic, which later I decided was like, wow, for the same price, you can get 40 panels, but you can get 75 panels of story. In my head, I liked the value idea of getting 75 panels, like giving more. Uh, it's one of the reasons decompressed storytelling makes me crazy, uh, because I just it doesn't seem like good value for the buck. Uh, but this is just, um, that was part of it. The other thing that George did was create visually distinct characters of various heights, um, uh, weights, body types, etc. He was really, really thoughtful about character. We talked about that a lot in drawing, like no two people look alike, like everyone is sort of distinct and different. George was really, really good at that. And so I kind of fell in love with this idea of inhabiting characters and finding out what made them unique and different sort of drawing them. I don't know about you, I'm an inside out kind of person, so no matter what character I'm drawing, it's these two lovely ladies or others, uh, I like to figure, you know, at least in my brain, how I think they think, how they work, where they come from, and draw their characters based on what I know about them. So how they stand, how they sit, how they talk, etc. all comes from what my perception is of who they are. What's my motivation? I mean, every yeah, time literally, it's always like, what's my motivation. It's a tempest here, who you're well, really well known for working on, and I mean that the joy, the smile, like that's like, how does tempest feel at that moment? Right. How does he feel at this moment? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> look at look at all of that. Those double, those that double base spread. My flat. I think that, I think it's I think it's twenty five, twenty six. And so, I'm really lying about that if I can say, like, it's still pretty good. Like, I'm like, that's actually pretty good. Uh, and I think, because uh, I think it's a wonderful time to be making comics. I think a lot of the sort of high points. The, the, your age or the time it was? The age. So, a lot of the, like, my favorite artists, I really feel like they peaked in their late 20s, early 30s um, for a couple of reasons. And I really think, when I say peaked, 
they had these moments where they were singing. Like, I think Jim was a little bit younger, because like, he started it's before the burnout, like the slight burnout, or? It's before they know too much. Um, and so I think the burnout, uh, it's because they have energy to do it. Like, George Perez did Crisis at 30 or 31, he did Wonder Woman around 32, 33, maybe, like, when I think about that, like, my mind is blown that these, these works that were so vital and important to me, like, when he was working on Titans, he was in his 20s, um, how young uh, these artists were that I admire so much were do, when they were doing their, like, primary work. Jim got, was doing, what, X-Men 19? I think he was super, he's only a couple years older than I was, so, uh, this, that famous story that I, like, he became really famous for, there was the one with uh, Captain America, Wolverine, Black Widow, and then another one, a three-part with Psylocke turned into Lady Mandarin, I think it was 20 years old, maybe 21 when he did it. And that was an industry-changing block of art, right? Oh yeah, oh, yeah they, they so, where we are now. Yeah, so I, I, I feel this, I, I think the work that I'm doing now is probably more sophisticated than some of the work, but I really could look at that energy of like Tempest. I'm like, I, I could not replicate that again. Is it just, is it because you have a harder time putting your, your mind in that, the position of those characters in that story? Or is it just because it's just it's harder for you to devote that amount of uh, time? Part of it's like, um, just physical flavor. Like, take advantage of your youth, kids. I'm telling you, do it now. Uh, but the other thing is, I, I hadn't heard no. Um, the interesting thing about working in a corporate environment over a period of time is you start hearing no a lot from your editors and from marketing people, and you're like, you start second guessing your choices based on they'll never let this happen. Oh, I couldn't do that, they'll say no. Um, and I think the beautiful thing about being young is that sense of like, fuck it. You know, like, you, have, you, don't sit, you haven't heard no yet. And it's why I encourage you to do, to work passionately is the best way you can before you absorb that. And my hope for you is that you never hear those sorts of no's that put doubts in your heads. And if you do, then you're able to get rid of it and just sort of just sort of proceed. That problem. <laughs> it is quite a while so I wonder if I had anything to do with that. You know, there was a point where I sat in a little room at Wildstorm and all I did was scan pages all day. And I know I scanned some of your stuff. But back then, they actually had the letters on the board so I could read it as I scanned. It made my life a lot better. A quick funny story about this. Did anyone here read Superhero Comics? So a few people. So this is from a book called Infinite Crisis. These were probably my two least favorite characters in the whole book. And I had to draw a huge fight sequence between them. Um, and it's funny because I will often say, like, I, like, I hated those characters. And people are like, but you drew it so well. As if by hating them, I'm going to draw stick figures, right? Like, I'm mean, like, it's my job, right? Like, that's what we do. You draw, you draw things you like, you draw things you don't like, and you draw them... I actually find drawing things I don't like makes me work even harder. Like, getting in there, and, uh, because uh, maybe either I'm good at it or I'm not interested in it, but like, I, I just laugh at this notion, like, oh, I couldn't tell you. Good, you're not supposed to tell that I don't like it. Your work should never reflect that. Like, it all should look like you had an amazing time on every panel. Well, that, that to me, goes to like, a point of like, a profession, being professional. Because if you have a job, you're going to do it, you have deadlines. Well, I'm not very professional about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're pro prolific enough where it works. I didn't realize you covered your, uh, through that page. Uh, the funny thing about this is, so, when he was looking for art for this, uh, I sent him, I have a couple of uh, portfolios on Dropbox, and this is the one where I talk about how I got to be got known for drawing death scenes. Um, because, as we talked about in class, like, I'm sort of well known for my emotive figures. And so they would just be like, kill this person, kill this person. And I made a list one time of all the characters that I had killed off in the Um Although I didn't technically kill them off when I drew that scene, but it was like, Jean Grey, Maxwell Lord, um, Wonder Woman's mother, um, and it was, it was, I think there were nine or ten death scenes. Superboy, like, I was just like, oh, I guess that's what I do. <laughs> I kill people. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a great pinup book. You just do, the, the, all the characters that kill was just a pretty big I, I was just like, God, I, did, I didn't realize, but yeah, that's what I did. They died. So what did you think, um, when DC and Wildstorm and because there, there was that late, in the 90s, you, you, 
20s, and there was this big upheaval in the comic book industry where you know Image started, and they kind of went their way. But you stayed with DC, right? I mean, you didn't really do any. Uh, like I went to Marvel in after Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman was a really weird experience. Oh, here's a good story. I told it a lot, but you're stuck. Um, <laughs> There's a very interesting thing that happens when you, when your dream comes true. And so, I got Wonder Woman, and this is actually a, a cautionary tale. It's all I wanted to do in comics. I lived for that, like, that was, I was going to write and draw. And my original pitch is a 12 issue series. It was going to be its own maxi series. But because of creative shifts, I decided to put it in the book. And from the get-go, it was an editorial nightmare. I was constantly fighting with the editor-in-chief issue after issue about this stuff um, that didn't really need to be, that we didn't need these fights. Part of this I chalk up to my own ego and this sort of like exasperated freelance, like how dare you, you don't understand my genius, right? The other thing was definitely a sensibility difference. The editor-in-chief was a meat and potatoes guy, I was like a sort of more minutia person. Um, uh, because I believed that in the long run that sort of stuff mattered and paid off. The big fight was over, they were, but my whole story was about uh, the conflict between mother and daughter, and suddenly I was going to have to kill off her mother halfway through the run, which meant I had to restructure the entire pitch and truncate half my stories to accommodate blah, 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 blah. This happens in mainstream comics all the time. However, I was well prepared for it. Um, and I spent years, the first year, just trying to, thinking like, if I don't do this, they'll take it away from me. And we talked a little bit about, in these various classes I just talked about today, about being, not, not working from a place of fear, and this is a perfect example. If you do, like, when you want something so badly, and, then, and you're afraid of losing it, sometimes you make compromises you may or may not uh, normally, and so just caution you about those, right? Um, pick and choose your battles wisely, but also know that it might not, while it might seem like I'll never get another chance, very likely you will get another chance and probably three more chances. Um, so it was a very, very weird experience, that book. I'm really glad I had it. People really responded to it. I have this long, like, respected place in Wonder Woman canon history, and I'm thrilled for it. But as a creative thing, it, was, it, was, it kind of rocked my world, because my vision was so clear, and I couldn't figure out why I was fighting for it all the time. Because um, I had not had to do that yet. Every, uh, I, I had one other bad writing experience, but Tempest was golden, JLA Titans was golden, Invisible, like all these books, it was so easy, and suddenly this thing that I wanted so much was so hard. Maybe because I wanted it so much, but I just didn't understand the fight. After that, I was like, I can't work for DC right now. And so I went to work uh, at Marvel, and that's when I did New X Men with Grant Morrison. I worked with Grant on The Invisibles, which is still one of my favorite projects ever, and I was obsessed with New X-Men, like I was so into that book, and then they asked me to come do it, it's like absolutely, um, but that book was a bi-weekly book, and so we were cranking out, I don't even remember it, because we had to do an issue every three weeks, and like to ask me to do that now would be impossible, um, but we were just cranking out, that work, but it was so much fun, and the end result was so great, um, and then Here's my other hint to you if you want to work in corporate comics. They never want you more than when you work for someone else. So I went to Marvel, and the minute I wanted to come back, they're like, here's a lot of money. Here's your creator own project. Here's Infinite Crisis, right? I was like, OK, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and coming off a successful X Men run, absolutely helped. Well, that does help, yeah. So you, you, get, you did, went back to DC. And this is the thing where I, I don't see that as like going from one company to the other, is because you're not married to those companies. They, they're they're your freelance artists, sure. Who's you know like I know I'll take a paycheck from any of those companies if it's work. Or yes, of course. <laughs> when it comes to coloring, um, but one of the things that you got to do was like you can do your creative creative own thing, right? That was outer world, other world, other world, other world. Yeah. Which, if you haven't read it, hilariously, is about two warring nations divided by an impenetrable wall. There's a dragon army in it. Um, and when it was finally optioned, I think by a new line, um, 
we could never get it made because at the time the movie Reign of Fire had come out and Warner Brothers was like super anti-dragon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, uh, the, um, my other funny part of the story is that, so the, um, the screenwriter attached to work with Steven Spielberg and he sort of gutted my, uh, gutted the, the book and sort of recrafted this thing which is kind of terrible, he's a very sweet man, but it's not good. But the first thing he did was get rid of the wall, which I thought was hilarious just in this Game of Thrones world that we live in. Because he's like, well, how are they going to communicate? I'm like, well, that's kind of the point. They can't, right? There's a barrier. <laughs> and he's like, now they're going to get rid of that. Oh, okay, like, like, you're in Hollywood, I trust you. Um, it was just fun. So you did that. I remember reading it because I think I was getting like three comps from Wild Storm. Yeah, that's, that's when we got three. Uh, Jeremy Coggs. Got I for that. Yeah. For the color. Yeah, yeah. amazing colorist. And, um, but, so what have you done about kind of revisiting more your own, creator own stuff? I mean, is it something that, because, I, I mean, that's, when I was kind of, that was kind of what I was thinking of with, with your name, but it seems like you've always really dwelled more in the superhero or the, you know, these companies yes. material. So here's the thing, I'm ashamed to admit this to a group of people who are creating such beautiful work. Um, I got the comics to grow superheroes. I didn't get, and I, I only came to realize this kind of recently. I've been floundering for a couple of years, sort of hopping about, not really sure what I was doing or where I was working. I was like, oh, I've been doing this for a long time, and I sort of accomplished what I'd hoped to in my business. Like, I checked all the boxes. And I realized that I love telling stories, um, but when it comes to comics, what I really wanted to do was draw superheroes. I didn't get the comics to tell every story. I got the comics to tell their stories. And that was a very strange lesson. Um, so what I'm more interested in now, there, uh, I've been just a tiny little bit, I was talking to Comixology, and I was talking to Warner Brothers about, the thing I'm most, most interested in now is combining my love for like new talent development, I have a couple of projects I'd like to do, and create some sort of imprint where I can art direct it, um, get new talent. Curate it. Curate it. Yeah. Uh, kind of like um, um, Young Animal. Um, that's, that's what really what I'm into, because what I what excites me now is seeing young people have the same sort of life I have. You're a mentor. You want to mentor? Yes, for sure. And it sounds like very, like, you know, hey, halo over the head. I don't need it to. It's just... <laughs> it's what, so bad thing. Like, no, no, but it really, that's really what, like, I've had a really good life because of comics, mostly, and I found out in the past couple of years, I was like, oh, you know what really brings me joy is seeing other people get these same opportunities. Like, I've had a lot of students who've gotten, uh, one of my first super successful students is now making so much money, and um, he's, like, just, he's just wonderful, and he was all, and he was one of those kids in class where you're like, he's going to do it. Like, he was just driven. Um, quiet and driven. He was really, really amazing. Um, and that thrills me. Like, that's super exciting to me. So, I, in comics, I think what the goal is is to create a, a line or an imprint somewhere. I've been talking to different people, again, that I can curate um, and then have, and then get other people working. Yeah, yeah, and bring new talent. Yeah. Look at portfolios and stories. And, Part of it, unfortunately, again, with corporate comics at this point, we sort of exist because we're story farms for media. Um, and so, uh, Warner Brothers, uh, a couple, three years ago, now optioned a TV show thing that I was doing, and it's sort of stalled out. And uh, as we sort of wait for Warner Brothers restructuring, et cetera, it's like, well, what am I going to do? And I thought, oh, this is actually something I'd really like to pursue. But I have to go with a story thing. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. It sounds fun. And I feel, I feel like that I think it feels like the public is so hungry for 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 interesting stories. And of course, you know, there's the things they know, there's the Marvel and DC and MCU stuff. But I think, you know, like uh, I just I just watched, you know, six episodes of The Boys. And oh, that's okay. Yeah, it's, br it's brutal. Right. <laughs> Just like it it is, it is, yeah, it's really good. In fact, I remember this little thing. That I remember working at Wildstorm when we were DC was going to publish it. Oh yeah. And the powers that be at DC just 
didn't, there was just a little too much to have uh, those type of iconic characters, not called Superman and Batman, but doing some really bad things. I think they, I, I, I thought they, they thought the authority was bad, and there's the boys, so it had to go on its way. And that's, but that's a, that's a good point where like, that's okay, because you don't want those companies doing everything. Because then, then, they, then they're doing everything, everything's under those umbrellas. You know, there's all these tiny, or small imprints that'll, that'll print just more vampire comics or all these other things. So there's lots of opportunities out there besides DC Marvel. I think the other thing, I'm, this gets really into the weeds, forgive me. I'm, I'm particularly interested, I don't know if you all are, in how comics are distributed, um, how people get the material. I'm obsessed with, because as you know, it doesn't matter how good your work is if people can't read it if people can't get to it, and if they can't get to it at a price they can afford, right? And so that's, so I find that in our business, having, again, had really great life in it so far, now I'm really interested in these other mechanics, and particularly, if I can stand in front of you for an hour and blather on, and you can take some information, and you can be like, okay, I'm gonna tailor my career, either here in college or the next couple of years, with some of these nuggets, like that to me is sort of what this is all about. Um, that's kind of what brings me joy. Well, what, is, what, is, what do you, if you, if you found, or what, what do you think about those? Because you know, there's there's the print comics, you know, you get your LCS, and there's comicsology, and some of those just digital distribution. I mean, do you, do you think that there's a, a future way of people getting comics that that maybe doesn't exist yet? Or I feel like you would know that more than I. Uh, I don't know. I because I, I don't have an answer. I remember you asking that, like I think. When we actually first met at WonderCon when it was in San Francisco, I remember talking to you about this way back then. And because the the powers that be at the publishers have been selling us for, for years, comics comics are not making very much money. Uh, or at least they told me that every time I asked for a raise. And uh, but they were you know, but the industry there's money being made, it's just maybe maybe not coming straight back to the con to the print part of those things. So, so as, I, as I was mentioning earlier, and we were talking a little bit earlier, I'm in a kind of a siloed world where my understanding of publishing and how money is made is in this area, and publishing is this area. Like, yeah. it's really enormous. So I, I tend to deal primarily again with corporate studios, that, that kind of chunk, um, where I think now these comics exist as story, I mean, they are looking for the next civil war. Oh yeah, that's why we. That's why we. Well, I mean, uh, like, I, would, I would suggest the comics that we're making now are more important to the studios than they are to the readers. I totally agree. Yes, I totally agree. But I mean, that is not as true with these things, um, where, and I mean that in the best possible way, right? Like, it doesn't mean the studios won't be interested, but it doesn't feel like these, wh whoever's going to publish these aren't thinking like, how do we put Robert's. this chapter 22 in this larger franchise? Which, from a financial standpoint, well, you know, maybe you want to be chapter 22. There are worse things. Uh, but you just have to sort of decide what you want out of your career, and like, you know, different factors are important. I, I would think that it gives the people making these comics the opportunity to actually focus on, on the content, and the things you really love. And, you know, you know, movie deal comes down, come, you know, the next Scott Pilgrim, or uh, you know, uh, something else that, that some talent is, is, is coming out like I mean, that, that's a possibility, but it's not necessarily a goal that you should have from the get go. Like, make a really good comic. And, sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, as, you, as you remember from my lectures in the past couple of days, uh, I do believe there's a commercial aspect to what we do. So, clearly, we want to put our good art in the world, we want to put authentic art. Where we want to represent ourselves well. We also want to make money. Um, we are here. You are here to be business people um, and to make money, to make a living through your the art that you produce. And so I think you have to be aware of those commercial realities. Um, and a, a deal, a movie deal, might not like change your life forever, but it certainly change your life for a year. They're a good thing to have. Um, so I never sort of poo-poo those, and I, I never like, oh, it's all for the art, um, because it's not, right? And if it, and if it is, I think you have to be a little careful. There's probably been a few moments, though, where you've, you've watched a movie, and you, you see a scene, and you're like, that was right out of my box. That's had to happen. Oh, it happened in X3, like when Wolverine stopped Jean Grey, I'm like, I drew that. 
Yeah. I got the money for it, but I drew it. <laughs> Uh, and I, uh, one last thing, just real quick. I, just, I, I don't want to be, I make these cash jokes, uh, basically it's lame attempts at humor. I don't, want to, I don't want to seem overly cynical about it. I just think it's good to remind students in art school that there is a commercial aspect to the work we do that you should consider. Matt, it's a plug up or? Oh, I wanted to ask a question. Okay. Oh, well, do, do you want to show the other, the oh, other thing first? Yeah, yeah. Oh, here. Yeah. Now this is something um, that I wanted to ask you because we're, we're looking at, uh, at, at your, your work over the years, but more recently you've kind of changed your workflow, or at least your the, the way you're doing things. And I was just wondering if you could kind of talk about some of that. Let's see if this is coming across the yeah, yeah. Go to the if you can go to unnamed the first one. These are this not, these are all compressed. Is there a reason for that? I just sent them right over here. I actually put them in your email. Here we go. But why he's, why he's making that adjustment, could you and, and why you overview it? Does that look? That looks like the right proportion for a folder. It's not. <laughs> It still looks really good. Uh, I mean, get the sense. It, yeah, it's hyper compressed. I mean, like we're doing horizontally. Sides. Um, now you you did these all digitally, correct? Uh, no, um, I started. That looks a little bit better. It's still a little. No, it's compressed. Um, we'll worry about it in a bit. Um, <laughs> Look at all those scratches. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll do. It's, it's not. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm a little self-conscious about it because uh, it's only the second time I've showed it, so it's weird. Um, I would prefer anyone taking pictures, please don't, just because it's a little weird. Um, but anyway, uh, this is why it feels really fun to color, too, by the way. <laughs> So if you want to go to the first slide, which is the bottom one, this the fire effect on it, not that one, this one. Um, oh God, I wish this was. So forgive me, I'm obsessed. It looks great. It does. It looks really amazing. We can't. Okay. So uh, I am currently working. Who knows who Kelly Sue is? Yes. Have you ever heard of the book Bitch Planet? Yeah. Okay, so Kelly Sue is, is the author of that, um, uh, her husband Matt Fraction, the writing team, he's, you know, does Hawkeye and the new Jimmy Olsen book, and they've written TV. So she's writing a book called Historia for DC Comics Black Label Line. Uh, it is a history of the Amazons, uh, one of those people, and what I particularly love about it is I believe it is the first time in comic book publishing history that the history of one of those people is being written by a woman. And so, Kelly's suit about uh, feminist has also applied a bunch of uh, feminist theory on top of this, revised a lot of the original sort of Marston origin. Uh, when she asked me to do it originally, I was like, maybe a woman should do this. So I actually felt really uncomfortable about taking the job, because I loved the idea of this origin story being told exclusively through a woman's point of view. She encouraged me and I took the game. Um, it was incredibly slow start really slow start. Uh, and one of the things I did was I switched the mediums in which I was working. Uh, DC, the, the DC sent us all this enormous paper because the Black Label uh, graphic novels are being published 8 and a half by 11. They're, they're larger scale, so they the paper. Um, and I had just started working on my iPad and the Procreate app doing art. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this thing on Procreate. And I have long resisted digital art for the simple reason I hate the Photoshop interface. I've never worn to it. It's, it's too crowded for me. I get too ADD about it. I found Procreate easier to use because I could hide things. It's just an easier app with fewer choices. Ironically, uh, choice making became a horror scene for me. So what I would do is uh, pencil breakdowns, uh, fairly large scale. Um, this one I actually inked some of the pencil breakdowns, and then I would scan that and finish the inking in Procreate using that app, uh, my iPad with an iPencil. 
And it has been incredibly rewarding artistically. The artwork is the best I've ever done. It has also been hyper time consumptive because I realized, as I was telling Alan earlier, choice is the worst possible thing for me. Uh, thinking it could look like this. Oh, it could look like this. That could be that texture. Oh, this could be that gray. The idea of having multiple layers, it, it, I am terrible. It really destroyed me. And I'm, I'm so glad, um, uh, or not glad, I, I'm so glad that this is not the case for most people because I can realize what a wonderful tool it is. But it's, it's been very, very difficult. It's really, while well, digital speeds most people up, it has slowed me down so considerably that I think my editor is, you know, his eyes bleed daily. Well, I mean, probably from how beautiful the art is. Here's the other thing. The artwork is kind of, even if I may say, spectacular. So, uh, like the first 44 pages are double page spreads. So that's the other thing. Um, yeah, so, he, so it, the labor will be seen on the pages. It's not like you're going to be like, oh, this is garbage, right? It's all the work will all be there. I want the absolute edition. Uh, there, well, that's the thing. I've also been saving every possible piece, yeah. um, every, like, so I, I, I Dropbox full of, if you turn, go back to the Hera shop, uh, this one. Uh, the build on this, the, I must have 40 different slides of how this worked. And this is, I think, four or five layers. Um, uh, but the reference hunting, the design work, all that sort of stuff, which is the shit that I love, it really has made it, I think, the strongest project I've ever done, but also the most time consumptive. Uh, I believe it's due out in December, actually. Of this year? Of this year. It's oh. a lot. That is a lot. I mean, I just the amount of detail in some of these things. Yes. Um, you know, you just have to stop zooming in quite as, quite as far. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm currently drawing this as sequence where one of his mothers walking through ancient Athens, and it's five uh, horizontal panels, and I have to be really careful because I'm like, oh, I'm inking every pot in the market. I'm like, nobody cares. <laughs> So here, you've got some of your underlying structure. Oh yeah, so uh, this is a shot of one woman's mother, uh, Hippolyta, and I popped it in there, it's a total crop, it's a really cool shot. Uh, on Instagram, you can see the original. I would actually drawn a regular horse head, and just sort of decorated it in, you know, gold finery. And then at some point, it's like, she's an Amazon, right? So, uh, I took a bear skull, drew the bear skull, put it on a layer, and then tattooed the bear skull with the origins, there's, there's a sequence of the origin story with one of the gods in Cerberus. So if you really look at that, it's like a painted Cerberus and then one of the gods in the tomb, that kind of thing. Um, but here you can basically see how simple, like I tend to block in stuff like this. Uh, I think that's actually on a separate layer because I was working with her hand in different, you know, the, the and here's the funny thing I've been complaining about online. Who, have you ever drawn anyone on a horse? It is the worst. The absolute worst. Um, part of it is a matter of, of scale. And like, if you actually ever look at people on horses, they're like this, right? Which is counter to sort of superhero dynamic when it's really big. Da, da, da. And also because of the way their legs sit, in perspective, their thighs shrink to nothing. So there's like this big torso and then just tiny feet hanging. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Um, and so I, I have not shown the final here, but it's, a, it's made, I, I have redrawn about nine times with nine different references. What was helpful about that though is in the drawing over and over, um, I figured it out. Like, like literally the process of understanding how someone sits on a horse. Funny anecdote, at least to me. So I was working in my gym cafe, because that's what I do, I was out of the house, and this very sort of elegant, red-headed woman of about 50 comes and she sits next to me, and she's like, oh, I see you're drawing horses, and she's French, and, and so very French accent, and then she goes, I'm an equestrian. I was like, are you? She's like, yes, and she spent an hour explaining to me how people sit on horses. <laughs> Where you feel it, da da da, like this leg would be here. And, and then she's like, and then what I love, you can't see it here because of the, the bear school. She's like, the horse's neck is too thick. 
Am I bitch? Like, can you just go? Like, I'm grateful, I'm so happy, like, you know, but then she's like, well, I'm like, no. And then I had to explain her that thing that happens when you're manufacturing fantasy, and it's a fine line between, like, realism. Realism, and then, like, just sort of Story. dynamics right on them. Yeah. Because she's like, oh no, like, she'd be much closer to the main. I'm like, well, she's not. Like, that's. <laughs> Much better she look out so close. I think the frame is perfect. I think we should be doing some questions. Okay. Right? But the Matt does say yeah, but first. He's my boss. Yeah. Hi boss. Uh, so, so so when we look around the room at our students work, one of the things that we ask of them is that they write their story, probably story. Uh, on all the different components. Um, but you've spent much of your career collaborating. And yes. Have there been experiences when you've um, got a script and you knew you knew better and you're like, oh, this could be done better and like put your own spin on it? Or is the collaboration always, I'm going to follow this like it's a recipe? What is that process like for you when you're working with a writer who maybe you don't even know very well? So I had the really extraordinary good fortune of working with, I think, the best people in my neck of the woods. Um, Grant Morrison, Warren Ellis, now Kelly Sue DeConnick. Uh, what's been really lovely, I've never collaborated. I talk to her almost every day. That's never, ever happened in my life. Usually, Grant would send me a script from wherever he was in the world. I would speak to him, I would talk to him. I would just draw in front of the pages. Warren was a little bit better. And what I think that came from was a sense of, he'll be fine. He's going to do it, right? Like. And I was kind of, I think I probably fostered that. Leave me alone. Like, I'll figure it out. I'll make it great. Part of it also comes from this feeling like, it is, I don't think it's my job to undermine my writer. Like, I'm here to do the very best I can to make their work look great, make my work great. And mostly I want to. Like, I think one of the things that's really stymied me on this project is Kelly's scripts are miracles to me. Like, I'm so inspired by the work that I want to make sure I get everything right because I want to honor her because I love her and I love her work so much. Um, so I don't have an instinct to, if, I, if I'm working with another writer, I typically don't have an instinct to sabotage them in any way. I, there are places, and, and part of it's because they know what I'm going to give them. So I'm like, you know, I think this could use three more panels. Do it. Great. I, I added probably like two sequences in this book that were not there, and Kelly's just like, that was brilliant, never would have thought about it, etc. And I think it's just because I've earned her trust, because she knows everything I'm doing in some ways to honor her, if, if not these characters, right? Like, I just, I adore her, so I want to make the best book I can for her. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I just, I don't, I, I remember one fight that I had, the mutual acquaintance, uh, and it was a philosophical debate. Um, that I lost ultimately because I was not the writer. So I'm like, okay, I'll draw it. I think you're wrong, but I'll draw it. And again, everyone's like, wow, that's great. I'm like, because that's my job! <laughs> you do it even if you don't like it. Uh, just a bit, just a bit. I, I, I just want to, like, just a technical thing for both of you, like, what about that common something like this that has so many great terms, great lines, I mean, this exquisite, like, textural detail, which is really new for your work, like, how does that get color? How does it color? That's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> so my colorist of many years, who actually colored some of the pieces of that, um, oh. Kelly Sue heard me. Uh, um, uh, he so there was a piece of if you remember this sort of matter. He uh, the sort of JLA Transformers. He colored a lot of my Transformers work. It was very sort of stereotypical, like, mottled color on top of black line work. Uh, he also colored, the, uh, when we started, the, the, the Linda Carter Wonder Woman. Uh, he did the painted work on that. The Wonder Woman with the, the, um, the lion and the sort of peacock feathers. That's his painting over this. And so I did that work in gray tone. So that's what he did. Um, what I have learned to do, so, one story about this, which I'm sure many, I accidentally compressed that file. Yes. It was 
So most most of my files are generally between four and six layers. I don't I don't tend to over layer some. I had one that was maybe a little bit more, but I tried to uh, foreground, main figure, background, and then special effects. That one, though, I accidentally compressed it and could not uncompress it. So he has had a really hard time with that. So what I did is actually go back to the original, pull out stuff, create new layers, so that at least he could get an easier time coloring it. Um, well, we're. I, I think it's going to be come down to the wire to see what he because the stuff he's generated there's oh he colored that yeah. um, that was actually a, that was an iPad is this is this you is this you here the, the uh, hatching that's yeah. it that's it that's your colorist yeah. Yeah. so I, I will go in the summer uh, I mean he's working he's got he's, doing tons of it now. What I also had to do, this is a warning for all of you, I was, in an effort to make life easier in my head, because if there's so much there, I was like, this is the color palette for this character, color palette for this character, and it was often more than a single image, and he got really confused. Those actually might make things harder Yeah, sometimes. Um, but I've done that for him before, and he was always in. It sounds like you've got a good collaborative effort or a collaborative thing yeah. with your colorists. Um, that's great. Oh, he's and he's he's amazing and sweet and fast, etc. But he was overwhelmed with a lot of work, and so I would say. So what I learned to do is just send him less. Be like instead of here's every piece of color inspiration because like on Pinterest you can find whole palettes for certain things, and that's what I was sending him. I think. The brown, or is it gray? Is it healthy? Thank you too much. Yeah. Um, you, sir? Hi. Um, so you mentioned this earlier, and I wonder how often you find yourself in different pots. Do you mean artwork that is more like you know, like you have the lines? Uh, how much of the background is for you? How much of it is it because like you know that it will look better? So it's just like like no one's going to care about this but me versus I need to. So it's an interesting question. I've been thinking about this a lot because literally I was doing these pods. And I realize that, and this is a highly egotistical thing, I think some artists do. Uh, I'm kind of drawing from me as a kid. I'm like, I would have been so into seeing all those pots when I was a kid. So I think it's partly feeding that. I want, I would like this book to appeal to people like me, if there are any, who will get a kick out of like, oh, look at the insignia on that tent in the back. Like, Part of it also comes from a sense of really like, these books would be seven or eight bucks. I want people to be able to go through it over and over again and discover it. Like I'm very into, for just because I liked that. Like I, I read this book three times and I never noticed that. I never saw that. Uh, a favorite book of mine is The Asgardian Wars by Arthur Adams from the 80s. And I will look lots of little lines and details, etc. And I still discover things in that work. And I think so part of it comes from that. Part of it's hyper-masturbatory, like, look at me, can you do this? No, you probably can't. <laughs> um, and like, it's, it's a little bit of like, what, what, how am I special, right? I'm not Brian Hitch, I'm not Olivia Cabriel, I'm not like, but I have to draw pots, right? Like, like, more than you. Like, I think there's definitely part of that. But it's also about giving, giving experience that people can go back to over and over and over again. I think I saw some other hands. Yeah, so I was thinking about something and then you made a little more concrete by saying you realized that you were ready to draw some heroes. I was thinking about your work on the Invisibles and you did some work with Constantine too. Mm -hmm. And although a certain nature of the supernatural story structure is very comic book the, the characters are sort of superhero adjacent in a way. I wondered how that was different for you or if it was different. Uh, the Invisibles are superheroes to me. They're like magical people with code names, like who wear outrageous outfits and go to other dimensions. And they're super, they, in my head, they're, they might be adjacent, but they're superheroes. Um, John Constantine's a little bit like, if I never have to draw another person in a trench coat, like, that's such a, oh, it's the worst. I, like, artists who like that, I don't understand that. It's the worst possible thing to, uh, to draw for me. But I tend to think of anything. I'm going to say super fantastic. I tend to think of James Bond as a superhero, right? Uh, my def I think of the Endless as superhero. Basically, if they are kind of outrageous and 
I, I, I made this joke, but I really believe it. I tend to think of superheroes as drag queens. So I, there's a bit of like, they put on this costume, they take a name, they become something bigger. There's a, there's a persona transformation, etc. And um, so, like, if you're an invisible, if you're Superman, if you're John Constantine, uh, you know, if you're James Bond, like, that suit for him is a costume. It's drag. So that's sort of how I think about those characters. Um, so, several answers to that. Uh, a bridge. One, um, confidence is sexy, so figure it out. Um, <laughs> two, <laughs> uh, two, on a practical level. So, currently, the, the current marketplace is such that I think Marvel is friendlier to new talent, I would say new diverse talent, like different kinds of uh, talent, it's simply the people in charge of their publishing arm. Uh, they're courting it, right? Like, um, Sana Amanat is fucking amazing, and she's really something who sort of courts, like, sort of new voices. Um, so that's part of, part of it is that. Part of it is creating a portfolio worthwhile, like, worth showing. DC currently is in this place where they're like, we're DC, we take talent, right? So the best thing you can do to get to DC is either draw a really fantastic Batman or have worked for Marvel, because that's when they're really going to want you. Uh, because they can snatch you from them. Um, a, a really a really good way to get seen is to have worked on an image book or dark horse book, a so, sort of smaller publisher, excuse me, with uh, similar genre material, um, so they can get a sense of your storytelling, etc. And again, they like, DC likes to take you. Um, you can be discovered. Oh, also, how many of you have strong social media presences? Make it really strong. I mean, I know that sounds really easy and whatever. Um, I, they're, they're absolutely hiring off Instagram. Writers have been hired off of Tumblr. Uh, your social media presence matters, um, particularly younger editors. That's a lot of where they're searching for new talent. Um, so a couple things. Have your portfolio ready. Um, be very, very clear also about what you want to do. Rather than like, I just want to draw superheroes. I think it's really handy to be like, I would really like to draw Batman. I would really be like to draw a green hair and black hair. Whatever it is, I want to draw a Miles Morales. Um, how a portfolio that shows focus and interest, I think that's actually really handy. Um, uh, it often helps to work for a small publisher, um, and images in this is smaller, but it's, if, you, if you are pre-existing, if you are a known commodity, currently it's easier to get work with them. Marvel's much more friendly to new talent than DC. Currently, they, they, again, they court it. Keep in mind, Marvel pays a lot less. DC pays a lot more, and they're a much less pleasant company to make art for. And when I say less pleasant, it's all relative. Marvel pays less, but uh, it's in the, the spirit of the, the publishing artist to grow. It's like that. Yeah. Hey, um, I was just curious. Um, you could speak a little bit more about why you love Kelly Sue the Conic script so much, and then if it is relatable to that answer, maybe yeah, I'm someone who loves comics, wants to write comics, can't draw, can't do that, but in the spirit of trying to make the best work possible, uh, knowing that of course there are many styles that you can approach, there's a collaborative work like this, but for you, um, is it the case where less is more in terms of direction or just, uh, you know, how do you get out of the way of yourself as a writer to let the artist be able to make the book, essentially, if that's possible? So, a couple of things. Yeah. Um, this is what I love about it. So, I want to talk about Warren Ellis really quickly. Uh, or, or, I'm going to talk about Graham Warren and then Kelly Sue. So, Warren, for the longest, wrote my favorite scripts because they were super short and easy. He wrote to his artist's strengths. The thing that Warren did was like, Phil likes drawn Emma Cross. She's going to be on every page, right? Like, um, and not necessarily really, but he, he, what I loved about him was he's like, this dude loves drawing the M16s. Let's do a war story. Uh, he really seemed to 
tailor stories uh, to the strengths of his, of his artist. And what's great about that is if your artist can't wait to draw every day, it's like every page, like, oh shit, I can draw this, the work will be better, it's a more exuberant collaboration, um, like, you'll be supercharged, et cetera, ostensibly, right? Which doesn't mean that you only cater to that. It's just knowing what strengths and weaknesses are. Like, I don't think Warren would ever write for me you know, a Vietnam War story, right? Like, I would be miserable, he would be miserable. Um, it would just, it's just not going to do well. And so I think part of it is understanding what the artist you're working with does well and play to those strengths. Um, Warren also is just like a, an amazing page turner. So it'd be like, panel one, like, monster shows up, panel two, accident arrived, panel three, and then he, what? And so he made a script itself engaging. So it was like, panel three, the monster arrives, and the storm throws a lightning bolt. You're like, it was, it was less academic and far more interactive. It demanded that you go through it. Like, just the language he used. Terse, short, economic, engaging. Somewhat vulgar. What? I so, so it's vulgar. I mean, for me, I mean, oh, they're, fun. they're fun. They're very good spirited, but he wrote to my strike, so that was one. Graham is amazing because everyone's like, what's it like to work from Graham Morrison's script? Like, the scripts are pretty normal. Panel one, like, the universe cracks open. Panel two, right? Like, <laughs> like there's what he's asking for sometimes, bizarre and crazy and strange, but the scripts themselves are formatted in a very simple comic way. But what I like about him is he does mini Alan Wars, where we have this flash forward in the future on some invisibles, and he wrote like this little passage that was not a tome, it was not a Bible. It was like, these are some of my thoughts about the future, and that should inform this. And so he knew when to just write like breezily, and then he knew when to inform, right? And I think a danger with some writers, particularly prose writers, is they overwrite. They, they're, they're, they're give, I do this myself. They give information thinking the more information they have, the better it will be like an experience. I'm that sort of person I'm like, what are they doing? I barely do dialogue. I'm just like, I just need to know, like, okay, there's five panels. Like, I don't have time. Um, or maybe I do have time, but the news is on. I don't really know. Um, but you get the idea. Kelly Sue, what Kelly Sue does, and she, she talks a lot about her, her script writing theories. So that shot of Hera, Kelly Sue described almost none of that. What she described, what she wanted was Hera facing the opposite direction. She didn't want her face, she wanted her facing left or right. There was no environment description, there was no costume description, there was no, it was everything that the descriptor was about the attitude of Hera, her take on that character, um, and and sort of the mission statement for that character. It's such a kind of beautiful, strong voiced way. She clear, Kelly clearly had a point of view. There was no question about who this woman was. So the design was left completely to me. And every object, every background element, none of that was in the script. That's all me. None of that would have happened without the language in Kelly's script that inspired me to draw that. And what the language was a point of view about this character that I'm like, I know fucking exactly who that is. Uh, and a lot of Kelly Sue is, is like, it's, it's uh, sometimes it's kind of specific. There's not, there's not really a lot of, um, what do I want to say, uh, action direction. Occasionally there is, but there needs to be something specific. Uh, a scene after a, um, a a midwife, she's like she's washing her hands, and like that was sort of important. So like that was an important direction, totally get it. But for the most part, it is she's evoking imagery by telling you who characters are. And you're like, I know exactly who that is, and I know what she's gonna be doing, I know why she's doing it, and I know how to do this scene. Um, and I wish I I wish I had this the sample script. I'm hoping that they'll publish a sample script of this when it's compiled later, because particularly it's, it was one of the most inspirational descriptions I've ever had in comic. And she might be like, she always says, you're working way harder than I am, um, which I appreciate. Um, but 
that's what I love about her scripts. Uh, I never question who anyone is or why they're doing it. And she never is like, and you know what? I really want them wearing low slung, the, the, like there's nothing she does. She's like, that's her job. Uh, and that's the other thing. Like, uh, she's very clear on these, like, she's like, 95% of writing, you don't get to tell me what to write. I don't get to tell you what to draw. And she's kind of like, stern about that. I'm like, good. Like, great. We have our rules. Man, how much time do we have? Cool. Everything in this piece is referenced. I'm not, I don't think there's an object or a human being in any of this work that doesn't have a piece of reference. Some of it's Frankenstein together, so I, I've been saving that again for like, I don't know if I'm able to use it because some of it's me, some of it's like Google image, some of it's reference books that I have. And uh, there's a shot of Aphrodite walking, and I, it's literally three different people, and I'm like, I need that arm, I need those legs, that head. And then I draw over the reference, like I step up all and procreate, and then I will draw over the check like there. Okay, good. Which is not, that's time consumptive for every single panel. Um, some of the thumbnail process is read script. Um, in this case, when I took the job, I told them that what I wanted was no deadline, and I wanted to be able to break the entire thing down at once. Very rarely in comics do you get an entire script. Uh, you're just kind of doing chunks of pages and hoping it all works together. Um, I didn't quite get that, but I got the first 40 pages. Um, actually, the first 20 pages and then another 20 pages. So what I did was break down the entire book, uh, which made payment a pain in the ass because they didn't know, they're very stern about like, in order to get paid, you need a finished page. I'm like, well, I have 40 unfinished pages, right? <laughs> Pay me something. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you can see the layers of work, like, the, the work was everywhere. But it was the first time I could see something in its entirety and be like, oh, this whole needs to change, I can tie this to this. There's a moment in this that now plays out 50 pages in, I'm like, uh, and which I never would have had that opportunity had I had to sort of work a channel. So, I laid the entire book out. Um, again, the first 44 pages are two-page spreads. So a lot of that was figuring out, and some of them have sequential panels on them, but it was making sure that none of them mirrored each other. So the ability to like literally lay them out, like, oh, I'm repeating layout panels, whatever. So of course correcting for that, finding reference. Design decisions took me longer than anything. Like figuring out what Harris belt looked like probably fucking took me a day. Um, it's actually from an old version, you can see it's totally ripped off. It's from a, an old, like, 14th century drawing of Juno, her Roman counterpart. Um, and I'm like, I love it, Steel, right? Like, um, the globe that I used over there is totally Frankenstein. Like, I found globes and different things, and then maps and Renaissance paintings and whatever, and I just, just sort of assembled that. I often print my reference so I can use it. Um, it's easier for me, I tend not to draw from, you know, even though I draw on a computer or the iPad, I don't re use reference. I like to be able to move my reference around a table and sort of match it up with other printed pieces because new ideas come. Uh, in this particular project, I, again, I hop around a lot, so I do 40% of this, and then I go back to the goddesses, and I go to page 14, and then I get which DC hated. But for me, it allowed my mind to breathe, and again, I was problem solving this massive puzzle instead of these tiny puzzles. And now that the whole thing is laid out, I'm just going back and finishing like the chunks that are not done. Really, are there any specific art books or websites that you recommend for reference? Uh, so I've been collecting art books for 35 years. Um, all of the, all, anything I would recommend, as I think I told you in class, are photographs, photographs, photographs. Um, all of the reference I'm using are photographs of people. Uh, you can find, like, um, 
new books, old books, but it's really people like walking, talking, they're like, it's, it's anything with a naked person doing something, right? Like, throwing the ball, right? Which is like, oh, look at that. Um, but any, anything that has uh, some sort of camera, like working around a pose, um, I probably have 30, 35 of those books. Uh, Google Image is your best friend, however, be careful. Um, I realized I was, I found this sort of perfect peacock reference, and it's like, and I realized, oh shit, I'm actually just copying the reference. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't modifying it, I wasn't adapting it, and I had to go back and redraw the whole thing, partly because I'm like, cheap, cheap, like I'm stealing someone else's art, which I didn't want to do. Um, but I was just like, oh, it's so perfect, I wasn't really thinking about it. I think a lot of people, when they go to Google, it's really easy, and you forget that that's just the first step. Now that you have that, you have to sort of adapt it and change it. Um, but I just voraciously collect book, like photo essay books, and just like things with pictures. The real world is fascinating. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more. Sorry. Uh, what was your experience like for uh, books where you took step back from the art and put it past the right? I didn't do that very often. I, I'm definitely a stronger... It's in your bio. What? Writer. Writer, artist. Because I, I would write... So the reason I would write for myself... Shut up. Uh, <laughs> the reason I would write for myself is... Uh, so I, I, I think I'm a sort of very delicate, fragile writer. Um, is when somebody wasn't writing was something I wanted to draw. Right? Like that was really it. I was like, I'm bored, I don't want to do this. What I really want to draw are robots versus dragons, and nobody's writing me that, so I, I would write something for it. Um, or if, like, in a book like Wonder Woman, there was a very specific story I wanted to tell. Um, I find writing for other people, I don't take a lot of joy in it. Like, uh, as we talked about yesterday, I'm not a strong dialoguer, I overrate, uh, which I don't mind, because uh, I come from a sort of old school thing where I don't need dialogue to sound real. Uh, I don't mind manner, create like, I, I think that's an age thing, where like the old Claremont X-Men, um, where I know younger readers hate that shit because it's not real, but I kind of love it because it's not real. Um, and so I tend to think my stuff reads a little dated, uh, but I don't, it's, it, I don't take a lot of joy in that. What I do enjoy is, so Kelly Sue, there were a couple scenes through this where I, I actually, she kind of knew what the story was, but she didn't have a sequence for it necessarily. That's not right. I'm trying to think how to describe it. It was more nebulous. And once I knew what she wanted, it's like I could beat out. I'm a much better visual storyteller than I am, I think, a, 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 a wordsmith. Cool. Well, I think, I think we have uh, taken enough time. Uh, everybody could please give a hand for Phil. Do you do you do you mind maybe signing a few comments? Why are you talking? I don't know because we're just talking amongst right. ourselves. You can't hear that, right? <laughs> Say good night to like or like mingle and all this, and I don't know if this person's gonna hate this or not. But listen, when the comics program needs support and need, there's one place I turn, and that is the Dean of Humanities and Sciences who came to our event tonight. It was amazing. So can we please give a round of applause to Tina Takamoto? from the Humanities and Sciences uh, Department, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, this was amazing. Phil, Phil didn't just give this talk, Phil gave two days of life drawing workshops. You served a thesis committee. Let's, let's, we let's, we let's, we're playing you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Thank you.
entire book. So there are like little stories here that will take place throughout the whole book. There. Um, what we're doing. So thank you.